Tonight's year uh, is part of the Biachet program, I just wanted to say that for Kosher too, where um, dozens and dozens of Jewish organizations just in the Thornhill area are coming together in order to learn Torah before Shavuos as a means of preparing for Kabbalah's Torah where it says, Vayichan Shom Yisrael Neged Ahar, that all of Israel camped around the mountain together. So it's a beautiful thing that we can get together. Thank you so much. The objective of tonight's shir is to discuss certain aspects of intellectual intellectual property in Halacha. We got started on this topic last week and I'm just going to review what we've already been discussing. I mentioned at the Shear last week that the main discussion of intellectual property as an issue within Halacha really only begins in the 19th century. Now that doesn't mean that it wasn't an issue before then. Um, pretty much ever since the advent of the printing press and perhaps even before then, there were issues of competing publishers who had to work out whenever there was a market, a limited market, and they wanted to serve the same market, and there was an intellectual property that was being sold, how they would be able to compete fairly. The reason, what I mean to say is that it only becomes an issue in the 19th century, is that up until the 19th century, the way that it appears that the post game were dealing with the issue was purely as a financial loss issue, which means that if you can identify a financial loss that a person is going to incur that results from you taking away his intellectual property, then that can either be defined as Hasagas Gavul or Geneva or Gazela, theft or encroachment. But let's say there is no loss of financial investment to the individual. Let's say I write a book and I type it out on my laptop. I have not invested anything into the printing of the book. Is there anything that would stop a person from taking that property and making money off of it? Since I haven't, I'm not, I won't be losing money per se. I won't be losing anything that I've invested. I may lose future gains, but we don't view that in halacha as a person stealing necessarily. So up until it seems around the 19th century is when it was viewed as, as long as you're not losing money out of pocket, it's very difficult to go after you for Asagas Gavul or any other reason when you're taking someone else's intellectual property. So that's point number one. We started off with a tshuva from our Rav Yosef Shaul Nathanson, who was the Rav of, Le, of, um, of Levav, of Lemberg, in the 19th century, in the early, earlier part of the 19th century, and he came out very, very clearly that even in a situation where a person has already published his Chidush Torah, he's published his novel ideas about the Torah, he sold all of the books he's published so he's not losing anything out of pocket, it is still prohibited for anyone to come along without acquiring rights from the, either the author, the author's heirs, or the purchaser from the author of those rights. No one is allowed to, other than those individuals, to go ahead and publish that work, even though the author is not incurring a financial loss. Okay? Why? Because there's a concept of Hasagas Kabul, that even though Hasagas Kabul classically is to take away someone's livelihood investment in the real world, and this is only in the intellectual plane, nevertheless, the Sholomesh felt that there's no difference. However, this is not clear cut. We pointed out that last week that the Talmud of the Sholom who's known as the Beis Yitzchak, disagreed with him. And he felt that there might be room to prohibit it, but there also might be room to permit it if the author has already died, he's already made his money off of the publication of his work, take that, pass it around, and all we have left is an issue of being able to make more money off of a off of a commodity that is owned by a particular individual. So the first thing I wanted to go over with you is one of the earliest chuvas, even before we get to the 19th century, of a discussion where a publisher is has begun the publishing process of printing a new set of Rambam. 
This was brought to the Rameau's attention. He's living all the way back in the 16th century. And there is a publisher with a group of partners, and he wants to publish a new set of Rambam. He wants to publish a new set of Mishnah Torah. And someone else has come along in Europe, in the general area of Western Europe, and this person is not a Jew. And he's taken it upon himself. He sees a, an open market to make money, and he's got a lot of, he's got deep pockets, he's got capital that he can invest. And he's decided that he would like to publish the Rambam as well. So the question is, and now, of course, you're dealing with intellectual property. You're also dealing with an intellectual property that neither publisher is in ownership of. So this is not the classic case of intellectual property that we would normally deal with. But this is why it becomes a, a gray area. The Ramah, in this particular instance, ruled for four reasons that since the first person already began publishing the Rambam, and he's already staked his claim, he's already started the publishing process, the second publisher should not be supported. Meaning, he says, I acknowledge that even though in the 16th century in Europe there is no copyright law, there's no way to uh, corner the market on the publication of the Rambam, but nevertheless, no Jew should purchase Sfarim from that non-Jewish publisher. And I'm going to give you four reasons, he says. The first reason, and I'm, we're not going to go through the whole tshuva now because we don't have time, but the first reason, he says, is it's that it's no different from a person who sets up a mill to, to mill the community's wheat, and someone else comes along and sets up another mill right next door to him. He says it's Hasagas Kavul, it's encroachment, and you should not support the other miller. You should only support the first miller. So this is the same thing. That's reason number one. In this reason, it makes no difference, even if the second miller is a yid. Now, it's important to note that the laws of fair and unfair competition are extremely limited in Allah. And therefore, there are many, many limitations that are placed upon this din. And in the practical sense, a lot of posts can disagree with the Rama over here. So if you wanted to, let's say, open up a Lafa restaurant, and then two, two stores down, this is just hypothetical, okay? And then just two stores down, another person wanted to open up a Lafa restaurant. If you could demonstrate that the market could actually bear two Lafa restaurants, so then it's legal. It's only if you could show that by your opening the second Lafa restaurant, not only will you not make a living, but you're doing it in order to try to cause me financial ruin by making me close up because I won't get enough customers or buyers. Only then can we coerce you to not open or to close your Lafa restaurant. The Rama, the way that he's presenting this case is that the second publisher who's not Jewish, at least part of his motivation is because he wants to stick it to the Jewish publisher and wants to put him out of business. And it could be because there were other areas of competition. You know, when you have two major book publishers in a limited market, and book publishing is very, very expensive, so you can stake your war in one area in order to ruin the guy's business in another area. So that's, might have, that's possible what have, might have been going on over here. And therefore the Ramah says, because of Hasagis Gavul, you were not permitted to buy the Rambam that's printed by the second publisher. The reason number two, he says, is that the first publisher is a Talmud Chacham, and there's a mitzvah to show honor to a Talmud Chacham, even if the other competitor is a Jew. Reason number three, you have to take show preference to a Jew over a non-Jew, and therefore, since the second publisher is a non-Jew, you have to buy from the Jew. And finally, reason number four, he says, is that because the second Rambam is being published by a non-Jew, you can be sure that he's not taking care to proofread it to make sure that it's free from mistakes. And so you're not permitted to purchase a safer, whether it's a safer Torah or any other Torah literature, if you know that there's a strong probability that it's going to be have errors in it, which will cause you to to make mistakes also. Like, 
for example, if you just leave out the word lo, right? And instead of writing lo yochal, you write yochal, then it can change the law from kosher to treif very, very easily. So the Ramah says that's the, that's the fourth reason why you should not buy. We can't prohibit the non-Jewish publisher from publishing the book because, like the Ramah says, it's a free country. We don't govern the laws of the land. But we can tell Jew, uh, our fellow Yidin not to buy that Rambam. Okay. Again, you see that this is not a strict discussion of intellectual property. This is an issue that the Rama undertakes the question as an issue of financially ruination, financially ruining someone else. He never undertakes the issue of intellectual property qua intellectual property. So, as I mentioned, we saw the Sholom Meshiv last week. The Sholom Meshiv is unequivocal, and he says that even something that a person purchased intellectual property that's not his own, if it belongs to him, it's like any other commodity that if you try to replicate it, then you're, elite, then you're stealing, you're encroaching on his property. Now, it comes along, and there's a similar... Uh, uh, comes along the Beis Yitzchak. As I mentioned to you, that's Rav Yitzchak Yehuda Shmelkis was a Talmud of the uh, Sholom Eishev, and he disagrees with his Rebbe. He says, and he used an argument last week, is that when people teach Torah, Torah is publicly taught. How can you preclude someone from sharing Torah ideas with the free market, with the public? He says it's one thing to say that from a financial standpoint, you're causing him a loss of money if he's already published his books, and you're going to compete with his publication. Fine, that's Einzach. But once he sold his printing run, he's made his profit. Anyone should be allowed to take his intellectual property and share it with the rest of the world. Intellectual property, especially when it comes to Torah, does not belong to any one person. That's the opinion of the Beis Yitzchak. However, and this is the paragraph which we'll do together, and it's in source number three on page two, the Beis Yitzchak in Yoridea Chelek Beis, or, or Tshuva Beis, he says, Amnam mitzad dina de malchusa asr b'medina seinu lahadfis. He says there's another reason why, because by the time we get to the 19th century, there's already a law in Europe of copyright law that the holder of the copyright can preclude others from printing. So he says, even though in halacha there may be no restriction from uh, uh, stopping someone, you may, you may not be able to restrict someone from reprinting your intellectual property, but if the law of the land does not permit it because of copyright law, you cannot trespass the, the law of the land. He says, So he says, you, the questioner, are challenging that, and you're saying, since when do we say Dina de Malchusadina when it counteracts Torah law? If Torah law says, I can publish it, it may even be a mitzvah for me to publish it, to spread Chidushe Torah, how can Dina de Malchusa override Torah law? So let me respond to you, he says. He says, He says, it's very simple. We have an example like this in the Rambam. The Rambam writes that even though the Gemara says that if you find something in the ocean, and it, even if it has a simon on it, you're allowed to keep it. You find a wallet in the ocean, and it has cash in it, you're allowed to keep it, even though normally you'd have a mitzvah of HaShavah Saved. What's the reason? Because you know, since this item was completely destroyed or precluded from the entire world, the owner has given up all ownership rights to it, and you're allowed to keep it for yourself. Nonetheless, Paskins the Rambam, but if the government were to find out that you were going to keep someone else's wallet because of a Talmudic law, you'd be in violation of the government. Therefore, says the Rambam, you are obligated to return the wallet, even though the halacha says that you can keep it. So he says, because of Ashach, 
the mitzad aminachayv laachzir, and the shulchan aruch paskins that way, and the shach says that that's the minhag of the where we live, and therefore you have to do that. Well, if he said yeshlamer who had din bazet, shekvar noagu shelo lahatfis miyiras hamalchus, chayv laachzik bedina de malchusa. He says therefore it's no different over here. Dina de malchusa says don't publish the work, and therefore you're not allowed to publish it. He says b'shegam she yeshlamer de davka mashu neged dvar torah laachzik mamon al yado hadvar torah betokef. He says and let me tell you even further. He says logically it makes sense to make a distinction. He says, where do we say that Dina de Malchusa Dina does not trump Torah law? It's only when, if you were to obey the government, you would be taking money from someone illicitly. Let's say the government says that you're entitled to pay me money and you have to pay me money. But Halakha says that no, I have to pay you money, not that you have to pay me money. So there we would not say Dina de Malchusa Dina. If the, if the Torah law says that I have to pay you and not you pay me, then I could be accused of being a goslin by taking money from it. And this happens all the time, by the way, and that's why it's very important when you make a deal with someone to structure who's from, you need to structure the contract in such a way where it's made clear that both parties consent that in any area where Dina de Malchusa contradicts Halakha, that you will allow both of yourselves to be governed by Dina de Malchusa. Because if not, your friend could take you to a Din Torah, and even if, if according to the laws of the land, you may be the victor, but he could he could prevail in based. So, okay, fine. He says, but when Dina de Malchusa is not taking money out of your pocket, but it's just telling you not to profit, such as in this situation, where we're telling you don't print the book, return the lost object. There's no out-of-pocket loss. So even though the halacha allows you to profit, Dina de Malchusa can tell you thou shalt not profit. And you have to obey Dina de Malchusa. And therefore the Beis Yitzchak says that even though according to halacha, it, there is no such rights of intellectual property, you still have to obey the laws of the land. He says, the kol shekein bedin zeh, shekvar kasavti shagon milavav, kasav shekeinu al pit devar Torah al kein tzarach laachzik bedina de malchus. He says, and one more thing. He says, there's even more of a compelling reason to not permit a person to take someone else's intellectual property, because the great rav of Lvov, my rebbe, who I disagree with, nevertheless, if he says that it's in violation of Hasar Kavul, even though I personally don't agree, but you should at least be choshesh for his opinion, and that's even more of a reason why you shouldn't print someone else's intellectual property. Okay. The only other thing, by the way, is there any nafkamina lahalacha, whether you hold that printing someone else's intellectual property is a violation of Hasagas Kavul, where you're stealing from someone, or whether you're in violation of Dina de Malchus Adina? Well, one difference could be is what if the laws of Dina de Malchus are no longer apply? What happens if a copyright expired? That would be a relevant issue, right? There are many times that copyrights expire. You have something called the uh, public domain. There are certain works, perhaps through the negligence of the owner of the intellectual property, neglected to renew the copyright. So, if you hold that it's a problem of Hasag Askavul, so then there is no time ex expiration based upon the law of the land. But if you learn that it's because of Dina de Malchusa, once the government gives you a right and it goes in the public domain, you can do with it whatever you want, despite the protestations of the owner of the intellectual property. Another possible difference, and this is just the word possible, because we're not going to paskin this way, la halacha, but there are those poskin who argue that the laws of Dina de Malchusa do not apply inside of Eretz Yisrael. That 
only outside of Eretz Israel, where you're dealing with Gentile or foreign governments, do you have to obey Dina de Malchusa based upon halacha? But inside of the state of Israel, it's possible that the laws of Dina de Malchusa don't apply. Now, this is not la halacha. I'm not giving a heter to. Uh, embezzle or to go above the speed limit when you're driving in Israel, right? But there is such a discussion. <laughs> How long did you have to speak? Right. But, or, or, or by, for that matter, not pay your taxes if you live in Eretz Israel. There are those who have tried to make that argument that there's no Dina de Malfusa in the, in the Medina of Israel. But if you know that the, the country can't function that way, then even if you can argue that Dina de Malfusa doesn't apply, but there's an ethical and moral imperative to obey the laws of the land, even if you can't, even if you're going to absolve yourself of the technical aspect of Dina de Malfusa. So I just wanted to point out that there are perhaps theoretically nafkaminas lahala. I also wanted to bring up, bring to your attention. I also wanted to bring to your attention a tshuva from Harab Shimon Soifer, Hashem Yikom Damav. Now, why do I say Hashem Yikom Damav? Because he was killed by the Nazis. Rav Shimon Soifer, there are two Rav Shimon Soifers. The first Rav Shimon Soifer was one of the sons of the Hassan Soifer. But there was a second Rav Shimon Soifer who was killed in 1944, I think. He was 94 years old. He was the grandson of the Hassan Soifer. And he was taken to Auschwitz and he was murdered as a, at a very old age of 94 years old. I, the reason why I am so touched by his story is that he, his Shilas and Shuva Sefer, that, where he wrote Shuvas, it was called his Orus Shuva. It was called Arousal to Repentance. But it's really a play on words. Because the reason why he called it his Orus Shuva is because he didn't mean to Paskin Halacha. And he writes in his Hagdama, I'll just read for you a short portion from his Hagdama. He says, Hinei shamati me adoni zatzal shomer b'shem mar abin zatzal. He says, I heard from my father the Ksav Sofer. You don't have this in your text. I'm just saying this out, uh, outside. I heard from my father the Ksav Sofer, who said in the name of his father the Ksav Sofer, that shalahoros tshuva lahalacha ulamaisa sarach hamoyre lios baki b'shasu poskin. That in order to paskin halacha, you have to be well versed in shas and poskin, all of Talmud and all of halachic authority. The second thing you need is you have to have a good seichel that can connect ideas properly. Shlishis, the third thing you need, Sarach Leos Gavra Demare Siyai. He says you need to be a person who has divine aid, who has Siyata Dishmaya, in coming to the right conclusions in Allah. So now listen to what he writes. He says, Vian Kigam Echad Misholosh Ela Lo Bihu. He says, Because I have zero of those qualities. He writes this in his Sefer in the Hagdama. He says, I have none of those qualities. I don't know Shas and Poskim. I don't have proper Seichel. And I don't have Siyata Dishmaya. And that's why, Lachain Ein Lismo Chal Chubos Ela Lahalach Ulamais. You may not rely on my Sefer to Paskin Halach. Now, between you and me, Rav Shimon Soifer, the grandson of the Sam Soifer, had all three in spades. But we can only look at this kind of Hakdama and imagine to ourselves how humble we must be in the light of such a person who died al Kiddush Hashem. I mean, it's overwhelming the type of humility that this person displayed. So his children and grandchildren who published his Sefer point this out. He says, that's why he called it his own Rishuba. Lo basi ela le orer. I'm only coming to raise ideas. I'm not coming to Paskin Shilas. That's why he called it his so anyway, he has a tshuva, which you can take la'alacha, and he asks
asks a very similar question as the Shaul Omeshev in the Beis Yitzchak. It's in source number two. He says, She'ela imuter lahat fis chidushay Torah asher chidei shacher ulefarsimam ba'olam Is it permitted for a person to publish someone else's chidushay Torah, Torah novelé, and to, to sell them? Beli askamas ha'mechadesh without the endorsement or the approval of the author. And furthermore, what if the author is deceased? Does the copyright, if it even exists, pass to the heirs of the author? And if so, it would be prohibited for anyone else to publish. So, I'm not going to go through the whole tshuva because of restrictions on time. But I will tell you this. He writes, very, very similar to the Beis Yitzchak in the course of the tshuva. And he wants to argue that there is no such thing as ownership on intellectual property. It's ethereal. It's not here. It's not physical. And as long as you're not causing a person an out-of-pocket loss because he's already published his sparring, there's no such thing as a commodity that is just purely intellectual that has value and that can be bought and sold and that you can preclude someone else from enterprising upon. But take a look at his second paragraph. He says, The Shulchan Aruch writes that even though when you find something in the ocean, we said, Al pi halacha of the Gemara, you're allowed to keep it. Even if the owner says, hey, that's mine, you're still allowed to keep it. But the Ramah says that it's tov yosher lahazir. It is proper and upright to return it. Um, skip the parentheses. The alfal gav de medina ina mechuyovim lahazir abedo seilu. Mikol makom im gozer hamelech ho abeistin. Chayev lahazir mikoach dina de malchusa. Behefker beistin hefker. Akan lushona. And therefore the Ramah continues and he says that if either a secular court or the basin orders you to return it, you must obey the law of the land or the order of the basin because the basin does have the, le the jurisdiction to take away from one person and award another person as they see fit. So comes along Rav Shimon Seifer and he says, based on this psaq from the Shulchan Aruch, v'nireh, hagam im chok ha-malchus neged ad Torah, ein ani, ein anu poskim dina de malchusa kid isa berash, v'huva bebeis Yosef simen chafav besof, v'huva berama simen shin samach des, sif yud alef. He says, now what are you going to do? He asks the same question as the Beis Yitzchak. What about the fact that dina de malchusa cannot countermand halal? So why is it that in this case, we do allow Dina de Malchusa to override the Halacha? The Halacha says, I can keep it. Dina de Malchusa says, return it, so I have to return it. So what was the Beis Yitzchak's answer? His answer was, because you're not losing anything. The only time you don't listen to Dina de Malchusa is if you're losing out of pocket. But by returning a lost object, or by not, or by not publishing someone else's intellectual property, you're not losing money. Comes along with Shimon Sofer and he has a different svar. He says, He says, but there's another compelling argument. What if Yosher demands that you behave in a certain way? This is a you know a mind-expanding concept. Halacha does not require you to act in a certain way, but Yosher does. Propriety, integrity, good old qualities that you were raised with from your mother and father. If those kinds of principles say to you, it's the right thing to do to return the Aveda to the owner, because he says, that's my wallet, right? So, 
de Malcuso Hucho Kavua, plus you have the added factor that the government says you have to do that which is moral and, and upright, then Baze Dina de Malcusa Dina. Then even when Dina de Malcusa goes against Halacha, you are obligated to obey Dina de Malcusa. Because Dina de Malchusa, in this instance, has Yosher on its side, and Halakha does not have Yosher on its side. I mean, it's a sort of a counterintuitive kind of principle. You would think that Halakha and Yosher are always aligned. But what Rabbi Shimon Sofer says is that not always. Sometimes the letter of the law does not require you to act be Yosher. If the government says, this is the moral thing and we require it of you, and Yosher is on the side of Dina de Malchusa, then even if, let's say you were living in a land where there was no Dina de Malchusa, then it would be up to the individual to decide whether he wants to do Yosher or not. But now that the government says that you have to do it, you're obligated to do it. So, he says, therefore, in our situation, where you want to take someone else's Chidushe Torah, he says, you want to take the author's Chidushe Torah. He was the guy who toiled and was learning and wrote and created these ideas in his mind, right? So he toiled and he was able to produce something that is great. He says, so what does Yosher demand? Yosher demands that a, a, a man who generates intellectual property of great value, even a halacha may not require you to deprive his heirs of enterprising off of that, but Yosher says that you should allow his heirs to have what the father produced. He says, this is, and therefore, you should surely let the Yorshim, the heirs, have possession of that intellectual property. And even if Halacha would permit you to publish it, because Dina de Malchusa is combined with Yosher over here, then it's the right thing for you to do. Well, we're not talking about uh, Gentiles now. We're not. We're not saying that anyone is putter from mitzvahs here. Everyone is chayiv and mitzvahs. What Rabbi Shimon Sofer says is that normally you don't have to listen to Dina de Malchusa when it's in opposition to Torah law, except when what? Except when Yosher is in the side of Dina de Malchusa. Isn't Yosher a subjective thing? Of course, it's subjective. It's absolutely subjective. But if there's a consensus, it's like if I would pull everyone around the table and I would say, you find a wallet in the middle of the ocean on your fishing boat, and the guy in the fishing boat that's just a hundred yards away says, hey, you found my wallet. How many of you think that it would be okay, Mitzad Yosher, for you to say, the Gemara says I can keep the wallet, so I'm keeping the wallet. You're in international waters. There's no Dina de Malchusa. Okay? So, we, there's a certain inherent Yosher that we've developed through our upbringing, both from Torah and from the Velt, I, I guess you could say. So therefore, if Dina de Malchusa is on the side of Yosher, you have to go with Dina de Malchusa. I don't think so. I think Mishum Eva is another issue, completely different issue. The signing the contract makes a difference. If the contract says the law of the province of Ontario applies to this intellectual property. Right, so that's what I was saying before. If you structure a business deal based upon the laws of Ontario, then another party cannot change the terms of the contract. And similarly, if you publish an intellectual property and you copyright it in the province of Ontario, so that the province says that no one has a right to republish that, so then you're then uh, Dina de Malchus is on the side of Yosher. There's one other issue that we have to contend with, and that is why is it that if I didn't produce
produce the intellectual property, when, under what circumstances, I should say, would I be able to preclude someone else from publishing a work because of the effort that I put in, not in creating the intellectual property, but in creating the presentation of the intellectual property. So let's say there's a machzor. Let's say my name is Art Scroll, Rabbi Art Scroll. And I have published a new sitter with a new translation. And I would like to prevent other publishers from publishing a similar kind of work. So at what point can I say that I don't want other people to publish the sitter that I've just published? It's not my intellectual property. It's uh, the Anshe Knesset Adola's intellectual property. But at what point have I sufficiently stylized the font or the commentary or the translation to the point where it's my intellectual property? This is another very important issue that comes up in the Sifrei Halach. And with the remaining time, maybe we'll take a look at that from a tshuva from Rav Mordechai Bennett, who also lives in the early part of the 19th century. And he has a very interesting case. His case involves the very famous book publisher, Redelheim. Has anyone heard of the Redelheim Flemish? The Redelheim Flemish was the gold standard of Humashim in the 19th century, and it was known that it was the finest quality, both from a publishing standpoint and from a diktuk, a medaktik standpoint, that they painstakingly went over every single letter, every single dagesh, every single shva, every single makap, every single negina satam, every single trup, and they went over with a fine tooth comb. So much so that the publishers, Korain, you've heard of Korain publishers, right? So when they published their Chumash, they based it on the Redelheim, some also known as the Heidenheim, because I think one's the name of, of the publisher, one's the city where he came from, either Redelheim or Heidenheim, and they based the, their Chumash on the Redelheim Chumash. Okay? Someone else wants to produce a Chumash or a Mazur, but not of the same quality. That's really the question that comes up. Right. So let's we'll start we'll start the tube. I don't know if we'll be able to finish it tonight. We may have to go another session for this because it's an it's an involved issue. So we'll start the first paragraph. It's source number five. It's in the Shilas of Chuba's Parshus Mordechai of Rav Mordechai Bennett. He says, Achare, uh, I don't know what that abbreviation stands for. He says, Kvot Torosim Yemeni Bikesh, Lechavos Daiti Al Derech HaMachzorim Chadoshim. He says, You ask me another Shaila about the law of these new Machzors that are being printed. The publisher by the name of Wolf Redelheim, a very famous publisher, is producing a new machzor. And he's put out the word that no one should replicate his machzor for 25 years. And a lot of Rabbonim have signed on to this askam. The Diren port, which was a port city somewhere in Poland, if I'm not mistaken, now there's another competing publisher who has started to put together a set of Machzorim. They've already assembled the typeset of several sets, and there's now a Shaila in Halacha. Can the Mr. Redelheim prevent 
these publishers in Derenport from uh, from publishing their competing matzo. So they came with this paper of a cherem, and they said, you have to stop publication, and the Rabbonim agreed that they have to stop publication. They, the publishers in Derenport tried to pay and placate the other the other Redelheim publisher. It was in, it was not helpful. And the Agona Mufla got based in Tequila Kadosha, Kempena, Side Bishusa Matfisim Shabekila Koisha Derenport, Machma Shekvarnik Muruiza Halokim, the Ahepsid Muruba. So there's another Rav who says that the Derenport publishers can commence with their publication because they've already invested so much time and money in the typeset. So let them finish their let them finish their effort. So you're writing me, you want to know how I would pass it in this case. He says, He says, you should know, first of all, that I'm not in the habit of paskening Shilas in cities or countries that I am not the rub. So I feel very uncomfortable inserting myself in this issue. He says, basically, who am I? He says, the Rabbanim in that town, they're much greater than I am. They're very capable of dealing with this Shaila. So why should I get involved? So therefore, I really would prefer not to, but since you're asking, I'll tell you what I think. Okay? Out of respect to you, because you're asking me my thoughts, I will share with you my, my thoughts. So it's a much longer tshuva, we won't have, and we're just going to, I'm just selecting out different parts of it. He says, perhaps we could derive from the law of Ani Hamenake. Now, what is the case of Ani Hamenake? So I gave you that short mission in Mishnayis Gitten in source number four. In the fifth parak of Gitten, it says, There's a concept of called Darke Shalom, which means that even though halakhically you may be within your right to take a certain property, if you know that it's going to cause machlokes, Darke Shalom requires you to not take it. So an example of that, says the Mishnah, is Ani HaMenakeh Berosh Hazayis Ma Shetacht of Gezel Mitnei Darke Shalom And Rebelsi Omer Gezel Gamur So the Mishnah says that if you see a poor man on top of an olive tree and he's picking olives and he's got a tarp at the base of the tree and he's throwing the olives down so really he's just shaking the branches breaking off the branches so the olives will fall to the ground he has not made a kenyan legally on those olives so really those olives are hefker so technically you have a right to take them because they don't belong to anyone but we've made darke shalom the mishnah says you're not allowed to take them. and the same thing is true by other cases let's say a mitzia the gemara says if someone sees a mitzia he says that's my mitzia or he throws his garment on it the gemara above the mitzia says he didn't acquire it by that but we've made darke shalom if he says i saw it first you should not uh, try to run after him. okay
So he says, so let's go to this law of Ani Hamanake, of the poor man who's shaking the olives out of the tree. He says, the bishvil de katara chabole gezel gam gezel mipnei darke shalom. Lenidon didan de hamad visarishon katara chlechaber abiur beloshon akoydesh. The gam he etiko beloshon leumim. She says, look at our case. Mr. Redelheim went to great extent to publish a matzor, painstakingly getting every word correct. And not only that, but he also translated it into German so that people could have a translation of the matzor. He says, V'asheni habo acharav, who wrote se'lehanos mitir chaso shel arishon, v'yeshbo gezel mitnei dark eshalom. He says, even if you could argue, that the second person, maybe this property, intellectual property, is Hefker, and it doesn't belong to anyone. But you should argue that because of Dark Eshalom, just like the olives are Hefker, and yet I can't take them because he shook them out of the tree, this poor Mr. Redelheim, who put so much effort into the publication of this Mazor, what right do you have to take his to copy his work? Because, you know, obviously the second publisher is going to he'll be able to save time by just transcribing from the Redelheim Matzor and publish it from there. Just, just retypeset it, but he'll be copying from the Redelheim Matzor. So therefore, it may be no different from the Oni, uh, taking from the Oni Hamanake. So he says, He says, but it's not a good analogy. You want to know why? He says, Debaani Hamanake Mechule wrote Se Hasheni Likach Oto Davar Atzmo Shetarach Bo Arisham. He says, there's the difference. In the case of the guy shaking the olives out of the tree, the reason I can't take the olives is because I'm taking the very thing that he's worked so hard to take for himself. He says, V'chein ba'ani ha'mahapech v'chulei u'v'ra'as ha'metziah b'chol elu no tel oso dover atzma. And all the other cases that are discussed because of Darkei Shalom, where he says he saw the metziah first, and therefore he can preclude me from taking it. In those situations, Darkei Shalom says, since he's already made the effort to try and acquire that singular item, you cannot take it away from him. A Vulcan matfis mishalom. I'm sorry, but vosas hasvarim ain't no to me meno also dover biatzmo elu matfis mishalom. He said, but this is different. This is replication. You're replicating the thing that this guy put so much effort into. He put effort into his machzor. This guy is not taking his machzor away from him. He's replicating his machzor. So it's not analogous to the case of the guy where he was shaking the olives out of the tree and you want to take the olives for yourself. He says, granted, Redelheim is going to have his buyers, and he wants to argue that his buyers cannot go to buy from the second guy, but who's to say that he can prevent that? Who's to say that that's analogous to the case that we're dealing with? The second publisher from Derenport is publishing a totally different object. And so you see once again from Rav Bennett that the idea of the abstract intellectual property is not judged as a singular entity that can be stolen from one person to another. It's so ethereal that the only thing that you can argue is that you're replicating it. So what's wrong with the replication of intellectual property? He says, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll go to the next paragraph. So the next paragraph, he says, we're skipping a lot of text. He says, He says, Therefore, Rav Bennett wants to argue that as far as the publisher in Derenport, he's not violating the laws of Gezel or Hasagas Gevur. He's not violating the principles of Darkei Shalom, and therefore he can't, he's not even a Russia. What is he doing wrong? 
Mitzila Rabbeinu Dam de Svirle de Bimitzila O Mikri Rosh Chule, the Maharshal de Bika Rebach Nikar Havale Kimitzia, the Kan Gamkain Havale Rebach Nikar La Hasheni, Ela Filu Rashi de Lomachalik Bekach, Haino Benotel Hasheni in Harishan Osa Dover Atzma, Avalo I Meniach Lehacher Shalo, Ela Shasheni Osa Gamkain Kemaseu, Kasher Biar to be Ezra Sashem. He says there may be a Machlokis Rishonim, whether you can call the guy who violates Dark A Shalom or Russia. This is, but in our situation, he's not you're not taking the guy's olives. You're replicating his olives, and therefore there's surely not even a Dark A Shalom prohibition. In Kane Yeshla Ayin, may Ayin Matsu Hagaonim Sal Mokom Lahar Viach Lehaecha Ulo Hafsid Lahashani. He says, therefore I don't understand by what right do the Rabbanim have to deprive the publishers in Darenport from publishing the Mahzah. We'll wait and see, because we have to stop the shear here.